Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Lori Narahara, the College and Career Engagement Specialist here at Tulare County Office of Education. I'm excited to welcome you all to the Tulare Kings College and Career Collaborative's fourth annual Counselor Conference. We are honored to host this event for you and are excited to have such a wide representation of our surrounding counties. We are here today to celebrate the work you do to support the well-being and the dreams of the students in the Central Valley and beyond. So almost a year ago now, the way we worked with our students became things we could no longer do. Counselors had to reimagine their advocacy and support of students. Counselors did not let what we could not do interfere with what we could do. In true counselor fashion, we have risen to the occasion and continue to overcome what often feels like insurmountable barriers. We continue to work hard to implement supports, finding any and every way possible to connect with our students. I hope you're able to reflect on how resilient you have all been as a profession to meet the needs of your students as our communities grapple with all of the consequences of COVID. Your work, your impact, and the pivotal role you play in our educational system has stood out during this pandemic. The Tulare Kings College and Career Collaborative is a regional collaborative that comes together with a shared vision to promote the success of all students in our region. We make connections between our K-12 system, post-secondary education, and the workforce. Our goal is to foster relationships to connect the work happening in all of the segments to help students achieve success. We also recognize that for students to achieve success, we have to address not only their academic and college readiness, but the social emotional health of our students as well. We have an amazing college and career team who work together under the direction of our leader, Joy Soares. So many of our team members are participating today as breakout presenters or have helped behind the scenes. Thank you to all of you for your help and support. I also wanna take a moment to welcome McKenna Salazar to our team who will also be supporting the work of counselors in the collaborative. Uh, we are excited to have her. And I also wanna give a special thank you to Therese Arnold, our event coordinator for today. She has done an amazing job helping to navigate our first virtual conference. I also wanna thank our counselor conference committee. They have gone above and beyond to help bring relevant sessions to you today. They are all busy supporting students. And so to all of you, I cannot thank you enough for dedicating your time and of course, for your support on making today possible. Thank you. To all of the participants, thank you for spending your time with us today and investing in your own learning and growth. We know how valuable your time is and we hope you find many practical ideas to implement improvements in the work you do for your students. This is our schedule for our conference today, which you will also find on your agenda. And we hope you're finding the Event Squid platform easy to navigate. On a side note, uh, or on that note, I have a few reminders to share with you for the event today. The Zoom links, like this morning's Zoom link, will go live in your itineraries 10 minutes prior to the start of each breakout session. If you haven't already done so, you must pre-select your sessions to gain access to the Zoom links. Breakout sessions have room monitors who will be assisting the speaker and are available for technical assistance. Uh, thank you to our TCOE room monitors. After each session, you have the opportunity to give feedback. You'll just click to the left um, of your itineraries on the button that says rate, and you can go ahead and give us some feedback on your session. We also have a couple of pre-recorded sessions available to you at the end of the day. You can add the session to your agenda and watch at your leisure. If you're missing a, a session today that you are really interested in, we are recording all of the sessions and then all of the sessions and resources will be made available to you in a follow-up email to the conference. Lastly, we have added to your agenda links to some short mindfulness activities. Feel free to use them during your breaks. We're hoping they will help you stay focused today. Now that we have all the logistics of the conference out of the way, I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Trish Hatch is Professor Emeritus at San Diego State University. As president and CEO of Hatching Results, Dr. Hatch leads a team of award-winning school counseling professionals who provide professional learning and consultation to school districts across the country. She is co-author of the ASCA National Model, a framework for school counseling programs, a seminal document in the profession. 
and evidence-based school counseling making a difference with data-driven practices. Dr. Hatch is also the best-selling author of The Use of Data in School Counseling, Hatching Results for Students, Programs, and the Profession, and co-authored three other best-selling books based on its concepts. These texts, yes. which focus on implementing elementary and secondary school counseling programs, are used throughout the world in the preparation and professional development of school counselors. A former school counselor, site, and central office administrator, she has received multiple national awards, including ASCA's Administrator of the Year Award and its highest honor, the Mary Gerke Lifetime Achievement Award. Well regarded within the profession as a passionate advocate and national leader, Dr. Hatch served as a consultant and advisor on school counseling and educational issues for the Obama administration and the US Department of Education. She is a true pioneer for our profession and a friend of Tulare County Office of Education. Please help me welcome Dr. Trish Hatch. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, passionate advocates. Thank you to Lori and the leadership of the conference team for everything you do to prepare. I heard Lori say that you did this voluntarily and in addition to everything you're doing for students who serve. So thank you for working on this, preparing us and for joining us here today. So now I'm gonna to try to share the screen. Let's get the right one up here. And then Terry will let me know. How did I do, Terry? Not yet. Oh, there it's coming. You got it now? You're good. You're good. So for all of you, Terry Torzinski, the amazing National School Counselor of the Year, Terry Torzinski is here as my partner today. For those of you who came last year, you already know that you met Terry because she keynoted here last year when I was unable to. And she is here as my right and my left arm today. If I mention something to you in the keynote today and you say, hey, where do I get that? And what was that? And it was too fast and I need a link. Terry is your person. She will copy and paste it in the chat box. Um, at the end, if we have time, we will answer questions, but perhaps your questions will be answered as we go along because Terry's gonna do her best to do that as well. So without any further ado, thank you for coming. Thank you for all you did to answer the call to be here today. You know, we know you didn't have to come today. You made a choice to come today. And, and, and for that, we thank you. You've taken the time to provide yourself an opportunity to receive. Um, and, and that counselors don't often do a good job of that. So um, <laughs> we don't often do a good job of that, do we? I'm gonna have to put myself in present mode, Terry, where it's not giving me good luck today. So hold on, let's try it again. I'm going to stop sharing and start. And this is what happens. This is why we say perseverance, right? When we have perseverance, then all is well. I'm going to try it again. And it is not working. So there we go. See, this is why we call it perseverance. We're into our hope score. So we're going to have to go back in and find my slides. You all get to watch me do this. Counselors, how many of you have done this before? Yes. And we're starting the marketing campaign. You know, this is very exciting. Is everybody happy about this? I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute, Terry. Let me try to put it back up again. Yep, just let me know if you need me to throw anything up. Yep. Yeah, it's actually not working. So this is the exciting part. Okay, let's pull it up again, the slides. We're gonna watch me do it with Tulare. There it is right there. That's because it was on Terry's account. How's that guys? Are we doing it now? Not yet. We are not sharing the screen. How about now? Let's go here. See? There. How's that? You should be good. Just make sure you're in present mode. Yeah, it's there we go. We'll come down over here and aha. There we go. Well, there we go. And see, it's not even nine o'clock. So we're still two minutes ahead. How are we doing? Is it working now? Looks good. Ah, there we go. Thank you everybody for your patience. Now, you see what happened here? You could, I could pretend and totally like mess with you and say I planned that, I didn't. But what do we do when these things happen? Counselors, it's probably happened to you a ton of times already, right? Know that when it happens to you next time, you get to say, guess what? I was watching a keynote with Trish Hatch and she messed it up, so hey, you know, it's no big deal. We're all gonna mess up sometimes. The question is, what do we do with that? 
how do we move forward and how do we be patient with ourselves and try to move forward so i had perseverance and i had hope that it would work and it did thank goodness for that okay here we go yay and right on time at 8 59 so she's already talked a little bit about me i'll move on i want to say that i'm glad you're here i'm glad you're here because you made a choice to be here so i want to do a shout out to First and foremost, our school counselors were amazing and awesome. Can we all just show hands and everybody applaud our school counselors for being here? Our district leaders, our directors, our career specialists, our administrators, our county office. I mean, let's just thank everybody for being here because you made a choice. You didn't have to come and you did. Thank you for all you do and thank you for coming. I wanna thank um, also the Tulare County Office of Education for the amazing partnership that we're now gonna have. And I'm just giving you a preview of a shout out that we're gonna be working closely with TCOE to work to improve the number of black, Latinx and low income students who are college ready and on track, college ready, future ready. This is what we're working for. And we're gonna be partnering to assist school counselors and administrators in improving that data for the students that we serve. Also CVNIC working together with us, partnering to improve college ready and these partnerships that provide professional learning and implementing data science and new mathematics frameworks and developing comprehensive data protocols, these are all gonna help us to be more efficient and effective. In a few minutes, you're gonna learn what I'm, why that is so important to be efficient and effective because it's central to our role of school counselors. So thank you to Stevie Nick for that opportunity. Also, I wanna tell you, Lori's been bragging about you to us. According to Lori, you guys are just rocking it. We've got our robust CTE programs that are expanding our student options. The county and everyone is committed to equity work. We are investing in collaborative partnerships. The graduation, uh, the higher graduation rates are higher than the state average. So that's good. Although we always know there's room for improvement and we need to close that gap. And we have strong college and career indicators for performance. So wow, thank you. Give yourself a hand. You're doing good work. We know we can do better but let's always appreciate how far we've come. So then again, also congratulations to the work you're doing. So I'm gonna take a deep breath and take a pause. And as I, um, I do this, I want you to center yourself as well. And take a deep breath because I know that when things like what happened a second ago happened, we need to take a moment and do that. You know that Calm app that's always on television and commercials, like the little clock, be calm for 30 seconds. Sometimes you just have to take a breath and chill. And then I look at this slide and I think, I want to remember why am I doing this? Because, you know, at 61, I could be like, I'm done here, you know, but I became a school counselor to make a difference. And I really felt like when I first became a school counselor, I worked as hard as I could to do the work that I could do. And yes, that's my son, Gregory Allen Hatch, who's 37 now. Um, and yes, that's me. <laughs> Huggers love live longer. Um, and I remember when I had got my first position as a school counselor that I had two schools with 1300 students. And imagine this school counselors when you're concerned about your ratio. I had one school on traditional and one on year round and it was elementary and 1300 kids. Can you imagine like, yeah, that was, that was pretty stressful. And I, I knew that I went to work every day with a full heart and I knew I gave it all that I had, but I had no clue whether or not I was making a difference. So I want you to take a moment and ask yourself, Two things, why did you become a school counselor? Was it to make a difference? And secondly, if it was, do you know if you are? How do you know if you are? So just take a moment and think about, do you know if you're making a difference? Is that why you became a school counselor? If there was another reason, then center with that work and ask yourself, am I making that difference? Am I fulfilling my why? Or is my life more like this? Now, somebody said, do I really want to show an emergency room in the middle of COVID? It was a thoughtful question. But the reality of it is the life of a school counselor often feels just like this too. And while our nurses and our doctors should get all the credit in the world, I know that you get credit every day because what you do, serving the people you serve, I know that it feels like sometimes it's just a revolving door coming in and out all the time and it never stops. I felt that way too with 1300 students. And I often felt like I had no idea if my work was making a difference. But I'd come to work each day and I'd look at these beautiful faces of these children and I would think about the ways that I could improve the work that I was doing so that they could grow up college and career ready. And I had no idea how to get out of the hole I had built myself with 1300 students. 
So what I did was go to both administrators at both schools and say, I need to work at one school. Can you fund me? And they're like, nope, no money for that unless you use soft money. But you're going to have to prove that we should spend the money on you rather than buying more. I'm going to date myself here. Um, Apple Chew GS computers with the little math blaster disks. Yeah, we had this chapter one room. And if you're as old as I am, you know that it was chapter one, not title one. And it was filled with all this computer stuff. I see somebody laughing right there because they know what I'm talking about. And, and we would spend all this money on that. And I'm like, no, we need human beings to help kids. And they said, show us the data, show us it works and we'll fund you. Well, I did. And I began to work with the students and collect the data. And pretty soon both schools wanted me full time. And I picked the one with these beautiful cherubs right here because they gave me a whole classroom as an elementary counselor to do all of my work in and do guidance curriculum in and, and school counseling, excuse me. At the time it was guidance, now it's school counseling curriculum. And I was able to really have an impact with those students um, at 500 to one. And that using data to show that it made a difference, made a difference in the way they viewed me and made a difference in the way they funded me. And I began to be interested in what was it that I had done to improve their confidence in me? How had I created a space quite accidentally where where both principals wanted me? And I didn't do it going in thinking that I was gonna use data and advocacy. I didn't want to be a salesperson. I just want to be a school counselor. But I, I realized that in order to get what I needed, I had to market and sell and, and show my data. And I wanted to research that. So I went back to school and I got involved in the National Association. Yes, there I am advocating for one school counselor in every school. And these are my parents now. My dad is recently deceased. But who doesn't want to go back to school so they can have their parents look at them just like that, right? I mean, that's a cool look. When I went back to get my doctorate, my advisor hit me upside the head saying, well, wait a minute, you want to research school counseling? I said, yes, I want to research what makes school counseling indispensable so every student in the, in the state in the country can have one. And he said, well, how do you even know it's a profession worth advocating that for? To which I just wanted to quit the program and tell him, are you crazy? School counseling is the best ever. But he said, I know, but it's my job to push you. It's my job to say to you, how do you know that it's worthy? How do you know it's really needed? How do you know that it's mandatory, not optional? I said, because I see the difference it makes in the lives of the students I serve every day. And he says, well, then prove it. Show me that and figure out how you can survive within the challenge that we have for most professions. He said to me, as long as your profession of school counseling is indeed optional, one needs to ask itself, is it truly a profession? Well, that was pretty frightening to me. So he said, let's study this and let's let this be your research question. And so I want you to know, I spent three years researching three theoretical lenses, political impact of the profession, organizational impact of the profession and the institutional. And according to my advisor, who is a master in this area, when you do not have political, organizational and institutional success within your profession, then it's like a Bermuda Triangle of school counseling, things disappear. Let me take a little moment to tell you what I mean about that. And if you want to make a triangle on a piece of paper and take notes, you can. If you just want to sit back and drink coffee and watch, I'm fine with that too. The first thing we're going to talk about is organizational theory. And as I talk about it, I want you to think about yourself and your program, whether you're an administrator or a school counselor. Rowan and Miskell theorize that organizational performance is the main determinant to organizational survival, meaning that if your program is inefficient, it is often eliminated or responsibilities are shifted. But if your program is efficient, it will survive and grow. So when I think back on what happened in my elementary school when I was in two schools, I was doing a lot of work, but I couldn't show I was being efficient. I couldn't show that I was doing more of what worked and less of what doesn't until I measured its impact. And I realized that when I taught curriculum and when I did small group intervention, I could see far more students and have a greater impact than when I saw them one-on-one. -on -one. I demonstrated efficiency and I demonstrated effectiveness and that made an impact on how they viewed me as a professional. Secondly, institutional theory. Institutional theory focuses on whether or not we're legitimate in terms of are we operationally and socially invited to the table. So when you pick up a brochure about the program in the school or how you register at a high school for classes, or if you look at the norms and rules and routines in like program documents, is there one for the school counseling program? Do you have job descriptions that adequately affect you? Evaluations that are appropriate? Are you written up in, your, the, in the student handbook with the appropriate role of what a school counselor is? 
if your program is operationally and institutionally legitimate, then these rules, norms, and routines, and processes and components are quite visible to the community. But when it's not, and there's no um, language that supports the appropriate role, then it's not as institutionally legitimate. Also, socially legitimate is important because socially legitimate means that you're invited to the important conversations when they make new programs or they ask, they make new, um, when they have new, let's say, discipline policy or attendance policy or they're changing the, the handbook um, or they're looking at grading policies. Are you included in the conversation? Are you socially legitimate such that they say, we cannot have this meeting without the school counselors? So, so far, I'm gonna go back one. I asked you about organization and I want you to think to yourself, would you fall on the continuum of inefficient or efficient? Are, are you finding that your, your work is being um, eliminated or are they adding more counselors? Are your responsibilities aligned with what you should be doing or are they being shifted? And are you surviving and growing or are, we, are they retreating? And as we think about that, think about it for yourself, for your district, for the county, for the state, and for the profession. So when we think about this, do we have rules, norms, and routines that tell everyone what a school counselor does? Are school counselors invited to the right meetings? Are we there in the right spaces so they hear our appropriate and passionate voices advocating for students? And finally, can we show that our value is worth our resource? Can we show that when we work with students, we make a difference because schools are systems that use their authority to allocate resources that reflect their value. What do they value? That's what they pay for. And so think about that as you think about the three areas of this Bermuda Triangle of Counseling. And what my advisor challenged me to say is in, if you're organizationally inefficient, institutionally illegitimate, and you lack political social capital, you are vulnerable as a profession. And that's why he pushed me to say, can you prove it? And so this has been my life's work to sort of help school counselors in any way I can to become uh, improved in these areas so that our profession has a stronghold. Now, what is our current reality for school counselors? Well, I sent out a tweet recently that talked about all school counselors are doing. And in the midst of this pandemic, I just simply wrote, and because this was the day on the 6th, you can see the day, January 6th. And I said, and now, tomorrow, School counselors will add all of this craziness to their list of things to talk about with students in education, in addition to COVID and death and racism and immigration and grades and everything else. I said, please take a moment and thank your school counselor. And I wanna tell you, the reason I'm showing you this tweet is because I have never had 354 likes in like a day. Well, what does it tell you about school counselors when, when they saw this, they retweeted it? It means, boy, does this resonate. Our school counselors are giving everything they have right now. And, and this tells me that they need support and help. And when we, when we surveyed our counselors in the summer, we asked them, how are you doing? Because we were hoping that by the fall, you'd be back in school, right? And so we asked them at the time, how are you doing with your compassion fatigue? I mean, you're giving every single day. And this is what they told us. And there's a nice little bell curve there. But more recently, what we're seeing is Cal counselors are saying, man, we were holding on as long as we could, but it's getting harder. It's getting harder because our reserves are low. So now we're seeing more counselors with not as much self-care. They're not getting as much joy as they were. They're working longer hours. And this has been difficult to see and observe because we consult and collaborate with school counselors and we're watching amazingly, incredibly fabulous humans giving all they have every day. And their sponges are empty. I mean, counselors are like human sponges. You know, we fill up and then we come to school and we give it all. And then we go home and we fill up and then we come to school and we give it all. And when we're really empty in our sponge, we can get a hug from others who can share their sponge with us. But right now the problem is we're not allowed to hug anybody very much. And that's a problem. So our sponges are like this one right here that looks like we've had it way too long and it needs a new one, doesn't it? I mean, that sponge right there is, it's been used. So how do we support our sponges and how do we take care of ourselves during this time? Well, first of all, let's do a self-assessment. This is our first little fun activity. I mean, how is your sponge doing? Are you this big and full sponge on the left because we just had a weekend? Are you coming back on a Monday just ready to be filled? Are you kind of feeling like a prickly sponge like this one? Or maybe you're this little hard as a rock sponge and you're like, oh man, I don't know if I got any more space for anything. Or there's this tiny little shriveled one over on the side 
take a moment like which sponge are you you can check in with each other and by the way just for fun if you want to let's have some fun you can just type it in the little chat box if you want to and you can say i'm which one are you right there and terry's going to do a little quick assessment to see what we come up with take a moment type in your type in what type of sponge you're feeling and if you aren't any of these then pick a new name for one you are And as you do that, I'm gonna move on. So the reason I put hope into the title of today's conference is because there is amazing new science out there of hope. And if you haven't heard of Dr. Chan Hellman, by the way, shameless plug, he's keynoting at our conference in a couple of weeks, but his work is really just booming in the nation right now. Dr. Chan has done amazing research on how the science of hope can change our lives. And you know, previously we were, he was doing this work because he's really working with students who have suffered traumatic experiences or may have had um, the ch personal challenges in their life educationally, or they've had tragedies in their life, but also the science of hope around their futures and college and career readiness. And so if you don't know much about the science of hope for Dr. Chen, I hope you look him up, but he talks about how hope is engaged to really positive outcomes and so because of that, I just want to take a moment to introduce you to this concept of hope and the belief that your future will be better than, to, than, it, than today when you have the power to make it so. And so he has what he calls a hope scale. And gosh, goodness, goodness gracious, I'm going to take a risk and say, let's see if I can figure out how to do that and still come back to this. Ooh, that ought to be fun. Let's try it together. Okay, so you're getting this in your link. Um, and you could do it on your own, but I'm going to do it with all of you and I'm going to have to, oh, it isn't going to go. All right. Well, I'm, I would have to stop sharing in order to do that. Um, and I'm not going to risk that after I've learned my lesson for today. So I, I, he has a hope scale that I hope that you will look at because the hope assessment score is one that you can take very quickly, very easily within about five minutes. And when you do it, you're going to see that it not only gives you a hope score, but it also is something you could do with your students. The hope score uh, gives you an opportunity to think about the predictors of well being. And when he talks about the hope score, he has research that shows that students with higher hope have better daily attendance, lower tardiest rates, higher grades, better test scores, higher graduation rates, and higher uh, college enrollment and retention rates. And when you take the hope assessments, only eight quick questions, and I'm not gonna risk taking it off now because we'd have to get back in, but I, please write it down and go back and look at it. You do have to enter your email address, but don't worry, he's not pushing his sales on you. He's just doing research, which is what researchers do. This is something you can give very quickly to yourself, to your staff, and, and the uh, information you receive from it can really help you as a school counselor to do, um, to do an assessment of your students before and after you do interventions with them. And the most important thing about his science is that he teaches us that hope can be learned and that hope can rise and that we can improve hope and that we can improve because we can improve hope, we can improve outcomes for students. So I hope you'll take a look at that. Speaking of hope, how cool was it that Dr. Jill Biden on her very first day as first lady came out and told us that she cared about school counselors. Did you all see that? Did any of you watch that? If you hadn't, there's a link we're going to share with you that's that there should be a link connected to this that'll take you to that if you want to see it. But she talked about how much hope of how much she's going to be supporting school counselor and then Randy Weingarten who's the president of the American Federal Association said, you know what, we need more than hope hope is awesome we also need help. In other words, she said, give us more money in schools, which I totally agree with. And also she said give us more school counselors and I also agree with that. But I want to share with you some of the few things that give me hope about our profession. And then I want to share with you a little bit about the direction we're headed. Some of the exciting things happening in our profession is that there's new funding that's available. And so for districts that want to utilize that funding to be able to provide additional support for students in terms of mental health or, or assisting families and students with more of the services they deserve to receive, whether it's professional development or additional resources, there's funding coming and there's more on the way. And I'm so grateful for that because our schools have been really lacking in funding for so long. We also have a new USDOE person in Miguel Cardona. He's in and we know that he supports public schools and supports the students and families we serve. And we're looking forward to seeing him adequately fund education nationwide and promote and support the appropriate role of a school counselor. So these are things that give me hope. 
Um, what also gives me hope is that she said right here, you had me at hiring school counselors. I mean, that's what I wrote. But she said, hire school counselors. And she sat right there in that room. And I thought to myself, hey, I've been in that room. Yes, I got to go there once. And that gave me hope that like, God, I sat in the chair she sat in and now she's saying school counselors. I can't tell you how much it meant to hear her say that. To know that no first, like right away, we didn't have to go teach her about it or explain it to her. She already knows the work of school counselors. That's so amazing. And I'm just so grateful to her. But what I want to talk to you counselors about here is what gives me hope about the work you're doing. You have been so flexible and so innovative and, and you deserve to be value, appreciated and valued for that. We did surveys as I shared with you before and counselors have shared that school districts have done a phenomenal job of getting electronics out, getting technology out, law, online learning has come out. We also know that everyone did a phenomenal job getting access to food for students and families they serve and communication and family engagement. But what we're seeing now is that now that more of the meals are getting out, technology is we hope, we hope finished. If it's not, then darn it, we need to get that done. So one-on-one, -on -one, every kid has access. But now what we're seeing is more intentionality and more focus on mental health and SEL and the culture of students. So counselors told us they were spending so much of their time, you can see this big blue line here, daily student outreach, family outreach, that they've had less time to do small group meetings. And you can see the orange here, which says never, and less time to do school-wide activities. We know we've got to now start shifting that. So what's great is that counselors were flexible and they persevered and they did what needed to be done. But what we're hoping now moving forward is that counselors can begin to do more of the work with MTSS and do some of the more uh, school-wide events and intervention events, because now that we hope that all the basic needs are being met, or at least we hope there's more of them with the funding coming, um, counselors will have to do less of the home visits. They were doing, they, I mean, they're gonna, they, they were not spending time doing home visits, but they now can be able to do more of the things that they need to do with students. They won't need to do home visits because students will come back to school, we hope. And that we, counselors can now receive more professional development that they want because they haven't been able to do as much in the past. So what we're hoping is that we're seeing shifts, more student family outreach is happening now. We're getting more mitigation of trauma. And now, oh, clicked on me. Now what we're seeing is great innovation from counselors. Like they're making these bitmojis, then students can come and families can come to learn about all the interventions. They're, these are fun. I mean, if you haven't seen all of these, I'm sure you all have some as well. I hope today in, the, in, your, in your breakouts, you're all sharing with each other the cool ones you're doing. But these kind of fun things that counselors are doing to create spaces where people can come and learn from themselves. You know, when students can come and learn and get resources themselves and families can learn about it and counselors make this available for them, this is really getting the word out to everyone. And, and this is very innovative, very cutting edge, and it's super exciting to see that counselors have been flexible and persevering during this time. It also gives me great hope that counselors are getting huge impact on the work they're doing. I recently talked to a school counselor who's running morning meetings for students who hadn't been attended. She made them completely voluntary and said, we're gonna have a morning meeting for 20 minutes and anyone who wants to come can. But she of course invited particularly those students who had not been engaging with attendance. And she had an increase of attendance and over 50% of the students that she reached out to personally and invited to those morning meetings. She was able to meet with them 20 minutes before class, was able to help them diffuse some of the things that they were working on. They were able to connect, create bonding experiences and it's improved their attendance. I also talked with an alternative ed uh, principal recently who said that since the, uh, COVID has started and they're at home, surprisingly and shockingly, students have earned more credits than they ever earned before. Isn't that amazing? It's really surprising. This gives me hope. This gives me hope that people have fun, that people are playing that people are saying that they're using their voice to have a little fun with this. Danielle Schultz is, is, is funny. And she was saying that when school counselors or someone refers to them as guidance counselor, that's the look. You know, the fact that counselors can have humor and make fun out of it and have a good time, that gives me hope. I don't know if you agree with this or not, but this meme has been going around a while. Uh, elementary counselors, I think that's funny. I have my dress up stuff too. But this kind of fun and playfulness that counselors are using right now, to sort of diffuse some of the stress is, is great, fun to see, it gives me hope. But of course, yes, we don't just need hope, we need help. So what we need to do is think about all the important things we're doing and how are we gonna begin to collect results on them? 
Counselors told us that the three most important activities they're doing right now is outreach, intervention, and prevention. And so if we're gonna be doing this work moving forward, let's find a way to do it where we can be organizationally efficient, institutionally legitimate, and have our political social capital, that Bermuda Triangle I talked about. In order to do that, we need to get into the art and the science of the work. We need to think about not just the work that we do, the art of the counseling and the teaching and the one-on-one, -on -one, but the science of the work, which is how do we measure it? How do we think about it? How do we design interventions? And how do we evaluate it? It also means that when we add the science to the art, the people will no longer wonder what we do, but they will wonder at the wonder of what we do. And that mix of art and science for school counseling is so important because so many school counselors are trained in the art beautifully. They know exactly what to do with students and families in their artful counseling, but not as many were trained in the science of the work. And this is the work that we do in, in, in uh, Hatching Results to support uh, school counselors is the science. And for me, this began with the science of the work when uh, Dr. Richard Wong, who is executive director of the American School Counseling Association, asked Judy Bowers and mine to first write the draft of the national model. It was the greatest honor of my life. It's been the greatest uh, exciting thing that ever happened to me to have the opportunity to write a national model uh, with all of the geniuses who, who came to those uh, meetings and we we put everything in a blender and came out with the ASCA model to create one vision, one voice for the profession of school counseling. And now that we have the ASCA model uh, in its four domains, um, and counselors, I know you know this, but administrators may not, that we have four domains and you can see how it's evolved over the years and it will continue to evolve way past what Judy and I started, but it began with thinking about the foundation of our program. What do we deliver? How do we manage it? And how are we accountable? And now, if you're an administrator or counselor listening and you remember what I said about organizational efficiency, institutional legitimacy and political social capital, the whole purpose of the model in my mind was that we would garner that legitimacy by learning how do we design, implement and evaluate a program? How do we build a foundation or now it's called define where we will deliver and then we will manage it and then we will assess it and then we will improve it. And this, this program improvement model of defining what they learn how they learn it and how to manage it and be accountable for it is a program improvement model that helps school counselors be, for, be more efficient, be more effective, be more institutionally legitimate because we have standards too and show that our value is worth our resource. But as the model is changed, central to the model is data and outcomes. And so we're gonna talk moving forward today in this keynote about how important data outcomes are and how important it is to put the data and the outcome into a system that aligns currently with MTSS. I'm gonna pause and take a breath. How about you pause and take a breath too? One breath in and out, and we'll take a 30 second calm. Oh, that feels good. Gotta always remember to do that. There we go. So as we think about our ask a model, and you notice on the left-hand side now, this is the most current version. It has a define, deliver, manage, and assess. On the right-hand side is, if, you've, if you're a school counselor, perhaps you've seen it, and if you haven't before, just imagine the MTSS model that most schools do. And most MTSS models just have behavior um, and social emotional. But for school counselors, we needed to kind of open that up so that we could see that school counselors also work with not just academic, not just social emotional, but college and career. So if you look at the bottom of this um, trapezoid, I suppose you'd call it, you'll see there's three domains, academic domain, college and career domain, and social emotional domain. And just like with every MTS, MTSS model you see, you'll see there's a tier one, a tier two, and a tier three. And inside of the, the, each of these tiers, um, you, you have what all students receive from the school counseling program. So now I'm gonna try to see if this works, and if it doesn't, that's okay, because you can always look later. Let's give it a try. Oh, it did not like me. Let me try one more time. It does not like me. Let me see if I can take it out. There we go. Yay, team. So uh, where you would go is you would go to the Hatching Results website if you want to watch this. And I am going to pull it up here. Can Tell me that you can see it. Yes? Thumbs up? Anybody? Yay, we got it. Let me play this for you because this is going to ground the rest of the keynote today 
and it's going to um, share with you what school counselors can be doing in each of these tiers. Here we go. Hi, this is Trish Hatch, and today we're going to talk about the multi-tiered, multi-domain system of supports, or MTMDSS. As educators, we're familiar with the multi-tiered system of support, or MTSS, which focuses on students' academic and behavioral needs. But for school counselors who focus on three domains, academic, college and career, and social emotional development, we need a more robust system. We need a multi-tiered, multi-domain system of supports, or MTMDSS. In MTMDSS, school counselors ensure that all students receive the instruction and support they need to grow academically, develop socially and behaviorally, and to prepare for post-secondary options. In this system, activities, instruction, and intervention services are grouped into tiers, ranging from tier one services, a core program of universal supports that apply to everyone, to tier two services, or targeted interventions, which would typically only apply to approximately 20% of students. And finally, to tier three services, intentional interventions, which would typically apply to between five and 10% of students. MTMDSS provides a data-driven approach to determining which of these levels of interventions or tiers are appropriate for any individual student. Under MTMDSS, tier one encompasses agreed upon services that, that all students receive, such as standards and competency-based school counselor core curriculum lessons, individual student planning, which includes four and six year academic and post-secondary plans, and district and school-wide agreed upon activities and events. Tier one is designed to be comprehensive, preventative, developmental, and proactive. Tier two is designed for students who are exhibiting barriers to learning, struggling academically, or are deserving of additional supports. It uses database decision-making to select at-risk indicators, such as attendance, behavior, credit deficiency, and post-secondary readiness data. Targeted intervention data elements, grade levels, and timeframes are queried to determine which students qualify for interventions. Depending on the student, tier two interventions may include short-term individual or small group counseling, progress monitoring, consultation, collaboration, and are referrals to resources within or outside the school building. Tier three services are designed for students experiencing emergency or crisis response events, or to support students with needs that remain unresolved within tier two. School counselors provide short-term solution-focused counseling, consultation, and when appropriate, referral to additional resources. Over time, MTMDSS allows school counselors to spend more time implementing proactive Tier 1 action plans and less time engaged in reactive Tier 2 and Tier 3 activities. The ultimate goal is to ensure all students achieve their greatest potential and graduate ready for post-secondary success. Do we like that? Hopefully that's helpful. So now that you have that, we know you can go back, you can share that with other folks. Your school board members might need to learn about it. Everyone needs to know the appropriate role of a school counselor, and I hope that you will share them with them. So the central role to MTSS, it all means all of course, is that what does every student deserve to receive because they breathe? And that's what this first circle is about, what all students receive. And what that means is that every student gets curriculum, every student gets an individual student plan, every student gets access to school-wide events, and every student has access for family engagement. All too often we see that some places, some schools, some districts only provide some events for some kids and that's not equitable. We want all students to receive access and opportunity to every instructional opportunity, FAFSA, College and Career Readiness, Kindness Week, all the things that we do. What does every student deserve to receive? That's what this is for in tier one. So when we think about curriculum, it's about what every student gets, not just those who ask for it. Is it developmental? Is it preventative? Is it comprehensive? Just like teachers have curriculum, so too do school counselors have curriculum. And our curriculum needs to be based on what a consistent requirement is for every student, just like math and English and social studies, everyone knows what they get. So everyone should know what the school counselor curriculum is too. And then 20% of that curriculum is based on local needs and school data and current trends that you might have in your district. Individual student planning. We should know that every single student beginning in middle school begins their individual student plan. 
every student deserves to have a plan for their future and, and you shouldn't have to ask for it and you shouldn't have to raise your hand and say where's mine and a parent should know when is a student getting it and that's what being institutionally legitimate is all about when a district decides that every student's going to receive this and they make a plan for it to happen then they legitimize not only what the school council role is but what students receive when we do school-wide program and planning are only some students invited or all students invited and can we make it consistent school to school if you're in a district that has different levels of socioeconomic, are some school high schools delivering different parent education than others? That's not equitable. All students should receive a, a grounded foundation in, in college and career readiness and parents should understand what it means to take honors and AP courses and making sure their students have uh, four year plans and being a part of the conversations around financial aid. And, and, Everyone should make sure that all students have an invitation and that it's appropriate for their language and their culture to have these conversations, but it shouldn't be that it only occurs in some places or upon request. Again, all means all, tier one. So making these decisions and what I like to call franchising the consistent program delivery to every student in a school, in a district, in a county, that's what all kids deserve. Then if things aren't going well, if they're challenged, if there are issues or concerns, then we need to know how do we provide interventions and which students receive them? And how does a student qualify to receive them? In the same way that teachers have MTSS cut scores for which students need an intervention or data that they look at for students who deserve an intervention, so too should school counselors have lists of data that they use to determine which students receive an appropriate intervention at tier two. And you'll see the circle is around district site agreed upon data elements. That's because everyone should agree on what they are. It shouldn't be different counselor to counselor. Your first letter of your last name should not determine whether or not you receive an intervention. And that's an appropriate distinction. Either everyone receives an intervention or we don't, but it shouldn't be random acts of intervention for random acts of kids. So we want counselors and administrators to come together to look at data driven tier two interventions to create intentional opportunities to push in no more random acts. I like to call this a fishnet approach, even though to be fair, that's a butterfly net, but that's okay. You can play with me here. Be able to think about how does some of these kids get it, but it's not random. We wanna be thoughtful. Which data qualify a student to receive an intervention? I like to think about it in three different buckets. Typically, unfortunately, people only ever typically look at tier two needs for kids who have attendance behavior or are struggling academically. And that's a deficiency model, which I understand people will always need to look at, but when we're looking at equity access and opportunity and closing gaps and, and making sure that all students have the opportunity to receive rigorous courses, then we wanna look at this a little differently. Are there students who are not enrolled in the right courses, who are not involved in extracurricular, who haven't completed financial aid? These are huge missed opportunities, and these are intentional, proactive things counselors can do to see which students deserve those. And then there are student groups who also deserve additional support. In addition to getting the tier one instruction, they deserve tier two additional supports and an additional outreach to them to see how we might support them to be successful. So these three buckets are a way to look at it. And the reason this is so important is that when we have surveyed counselors to have them put down on little sticky notes, what are you doing in each of these areas? You see the big gap lives in tier two college and career readiness. This is what we're gonna be focusing on a lot when our, with our partnership that we're having with Tulare County Office of Ed and, and Sivanik. And because we wanna really work hard on closing this equity and access gap in the college and career readiness level at tier two in particular. We, we, we're pretty good about knowing what all kids get tier one, I think, but we're not as good of being CSI detectives and going after important data at the secondary level to, to really pr um, promote and support the proactive work to make sure every student has this opportunity. And you can see here, these types of data points are the kind of data points we need to look at. Now you're probably thinking, I don't have time to figure that out and I don't have a system to do it. Well, that's what we're going to be working with them about is creating systems that don't look like this or, or this cartoon. I'm not disorganized. I don't know exactly where everything is. The newer stuff's at the top and the older's at the bottom. Yeah, this, this is going to be difficult for school counselors who are thinking, I don't know what to do with that data or how to get it. We want to create systems that work for you. Now, Whitney Triplett, who works with us and uh, is, our, is our director of, of professional development at Hatching Results, 
when she was a school counselor in Chicago Public Schools, because in 2008, we didn't have student database systems that could do this, she literally had to make her own Excel spreadsheet. I mean, isn't this crazy and nuts? You're probably looking at this going, oh man, that's a lot of work. Okay, we are not asking you to do that. What we're asking you to do is, is know that you want this and to push hard on your admin, sorry admin, but I'm pushing on you, to make sure our student database systems provide counselors easy access to this data without having to make one of these. Because doggone it, the struggle is real. Counselors do not have time to put all this in an Excel spreadsheet. What they should be able to do though, is look at the data, have a, have a dashboard that looks at early warning signs and then commit to an appropriate intervention for those students. In order to do that, we have to first begin with asking ourselves, which data points matter? Which data points are essential? Which data points are appropriate? Now, this document here is one we often use for elementary or middle school, where we talk about, okay, will we just work with every kid who has attendance, but how do we define attendance? Is it full day absence? Is it tardies? How about behavior? Which behavior? Is it after one referral or three referrals or a suspension? So this is a planning tool that, that we often use with districts to have conversations about, let's come to an agreement for what's the data element, which students to which grade level, and how often will we um, work with them? And now you can see it's hot linked, and there it is, it, it opened up, and it also has a second page for course failures, credit deficiency, A through G, and anything else you wanna add as a data element. Well, as we look at these, these, we're asking you to think about having conversations. You don't want to measure everything you do, you'd lose your mind. But we do want you to think about which data elements you would want to collect. And yes, if you click on it twice, it will go there twice. There you go. So, <laughs> okay, so no, tier three is for students who need additional support beyond tier two. With tier two, you can see the interventions might be small group or referral to resources or consultation or collaboration. But with tier three, now we're looking at students who either were having trouble in tier two and need more support, or they went right to tier three because they might've had a crisis. In tier three, it's short intensified support, but often referring to additional resources because counselors are not therapists and we do not do therapy and that's not our role. So the kind of students that may qualify for tier three, maybe it's a student who's a senior who had an inadequate student aid report or they rescinded their admission like these are crisis for those students who are seniors and might now realize that oh no you know they they were dropping out in their first semester or they're they're not completing their fafsa and they're going to miss out on that opportunity once getting accepted so sometimes these college and career tier three things don't get thought about or can or or included in the conversation about what is tier three but each of our domains have a tier three element there and it's important for counselors to think about, let's not spend all of our time in tier three, but some of our time in tier three. And how do we support our students to uh, get the support they need in tier three and then back into either tier two or tier one. Now, this is far too much for you to go over. You're like, I cannot read this. I know you can't. This is why we gave you the PowerPoint slide because you might say, wow, I'd like a copy of that to look at it later. Yes. So we're giving this to you so you can do that. You can print it out. These are just ideas and examples. We work with a lot of districts all over the country and we've compiled samples and examples of different types of data that other districts might be looking for and looking at. And I would encourage you to have conversations with your department about the kinds of data you wanna collect and, and which data you wanna to commit to collecting regularly and which data you might wanna look at more intermittently, maybe every quarter or semester. But this is the conversations that counselors need to have with administrators so that they're not doing random acts of data, but they're doing thoughtful, intentional, agreed upon data, and that they're looking at that data to drive appropriate curriculum and interventions. Once you decide on the data that you want, whether it's college access data or, or whatever data you're collecting, please don't forget to break it down by student group so that you can see if there are gaps in your data to see whether, just because your whole school's doing well, Maybe some students aren't doing as well and we need to disaggregate that data. Um, and just a note on the side, if you don't have National Clearinghouse data, we certainly hope that you will get access to that because that can give you that data and you can see how your students are doing. So once you think about the data you wanna look at and collect, then you have to ask yourself, how do we as school counselors know that what we're doing is making a difference? How do we know that the work we do every day is making a difference? Well, I like to use this logic model so that when counselors are, are either teaching curriculum or doing an intervention, 
they're thinking about what do I want the, the student to believe, to know, and to do? What kind of behavior change am I looking for? And what outcome do I hope that behavior change will impact? Because if I cannot answer that question, then it's important to think about why am I doing the intervention? We have to be really clear about it. Is it not, do they not believe coming to school matters? Do they not know what time school starts? Do they not have the knowledge to figure out how to, I don't know, to log on? Like what is needed here so that we get the appropriate behavior change, we get the desired outcome. And when we're thoughtful in this capacity, it leads to a larger conceptual diagram. When we're teaching students curriculum, like we talked about before in tier one, I want the counselors to be thoughtful about, and I want administrators to ask counselors to be thoughtful about, what attitude, knowledge, and skills are you hoping students will gain from this curriculum? And counselors, the way that we become more legitimate within our system is for our administrators to advocate for us with our teachers to say, when our counselors need to teach curriculum in the classroom on study strategies, conflict resolution, FAFSA, or whatever it is, we want the administrators to be able to say, when the counselor is teaching this, they are working to improve the student's knowledge, attitudes, and skills so that the behaviors will improve and we'll get the achievement we need. And so counselors, it's important for you to be able to verbalize this to your administrators so that they can also share uh, with the faculty why you need time in the classroom to do this work. And then when counselors are pulling students out, they look at it the other way. The intentional intervention, the arrow goes this direction to say, if we are challenged by something in this data, then what is the contributing factor to it? Let's not make an assumption that it's just attendance. Maybe there's another issue that's going on. We need to be like a CSI investigator and figure it out. And then we go this direction to say, what attitude, knowledge, and skills is attributing to that? And then we come over here and do the work. Let me give you an example. Because this, in, this intervention that counselors need to uh, think about has to connect to the behavior change they're hoping to happen. So let me show you. So here is a conceptual link for a curriculum lesson. Here's a lesson that counselors are teaching and post-secondary choices in an English class for teachers. And here's the concept. This is what we plan to teach. These are the beliefs we want students to have that it's important to research uh, match and fit, that we have the skills to research websites, that we have the knowledge about which tests are needed for entrance, that the behavior change will be that we are completing our post-secondary applications and that our achievement data is post-secondary acceptance. You see, when counselors can show what I'm teaching is leading to an outcome and we're measuring this and we're explaining that what we teach aligns with our outcomes, this helps other educators see the value and importance of the work we do every day. When we do interventions, it's important to explain to them we don't just take students with two or more Fs and just decide they all just need a small group intervention for study skills. I mean, maybe they do, but maybe they actually need tutoring or maybe they're homeless or maybe they've had a death in the family. It could be a lot of other things too. So counselors, the first we want you to ask, what's the barrier? And maybe you want to ask them a survey of like, well, of all these five things, what's your biggest barrier to it? Is it really that you don't have study skills? If the answer is yes, then that's the kind of intervention you're going to want. But it may not be that. It may be that they have study skills great, but the work's just too hard or they're not in the right placement or they have a family situation that's a problem that could be a whole different intervention. But if the issue is homework and classroom completion, then would counselors need to be a CSI agent? What don't they believe about uh, homework completion? What don't they know how to do? What is the skill they need to learn? And then how can you provide that support? And then when we determine the needs, we do an intervention and we measure the results. This thoughtful, intentional work of a school counselor require, requires time and patience and thoughtfulness and an agreement with your administrator that this is valuable and important work. You know, we all are looking at the state dashboards, but now we know they all don't matter because all the data is not being collected, but it will matter again someday. So it's important to remember that when we're doing this work, we're trying to make sure all our students graduate college and career ready. And I want to share with you that there are places doing this work that are really making a difference. When we worked for three years with Reach Higher Shasta, you can see the difference they were able to make. Look at their college and career indicator. This was the state of California, the dark blue, and here's the light blue. They went from 47 to 62 to 71 in three years. And why? Because school counselors and administrators partnered together to agree on what core curriculum every kid and parent would get, what interventions they would go after, what closing the gap activities they would do, and they stayed in tier one, two, and three, they all worked on it together as a county, and you can see the tremendous results they're getting here. And they outperformed the state by 39%.
I mean, that's amazing. This is the kind of work we'd like to do. But in order to do it, we need a team. We need a team of counselors and administrators partnering together and coming together. We also need counselors to come from all your different schools to make an all-star team in the county. And just like football teams compete against each other during the year, but they come together for the all-star team uh, and they play against different counties, so too do we want the districts in Tulare to come together and be able to start to get some consensus around what can each district or player bring to the team and let's capitalize on the gifts each district has. Let's try to get some consensus around that and create an all-star team of school counselors and administrators in Tulare doing this work. So as you think about the conference you're in today, think about how not just you as school counselors, but maybe your social workers, psychologists, college and career specialists, like how are you all gonna work together to get on the same page, to become organizationally efficient so that you're all agreeing about what you're doing, institutionally legitimate so that we write it down and that you're invited to the right meetings, politically have your social capital showing your value and your resources that how you're making a difference how will we get on the same page and what are your next steps for this? Well, I want you to know there's a lot of great resources out there and the next five slides are just are, are resources that if you haven't seen them, we wanted you to know exist. Many of the people at the Cal California Association of School Counselors have worked very hard to, um, to put together documents and resources. This one was done with social workers and psychologists. How do we foster the whole child? And it's a guide to mental health professionals. If you haven't seen it, we hope you'll take a look. There are other wonderful documents that counselors and administrators can reference, like reentry guides from the American School Counselor Associations and school psychologists. There are also roadmaps for reopening schools that ASCA put together along with CASEL. There's so many resources. So we wanted you to know that if you haven't seen these yet and you're saying, oh, that's the first time I saw that, please set aside some time to investigate these resources. Know that there is a lot out there. This one with CASC and WISCA has a huge amount of resources, lessons, examples, samples. There's so much to support school counselors right now. And then this is one that we worked on with um, California MTSS to talk about the counselor's role in tier one, tier two, and tier three with regard to mental health and students' mental health. And what's important around this is right in the middle here because when Lori asked me to speak today, she said, make sure you give them some resources for student mental health. Right here, now that we've talked so much about the difference between tier one, tier two, and tier three, notice that you have examples here in the middle of what students can receive for universal, for supplemental, and for intensified interventions. And all of these documents are hot linked and every one of them have resources. And you can use these documents as supports to advocate for the work that you do. We know that National School Counselor Week's coming up pretty soon, and I'm super excited about that. I'm always delighted about National School Counselor Week because um, the funny part of it is you kind of think people will celebrate you, but you end up celebrating them and thanking them for having us. What's that about, counselors? We always do that, right? I always like used to thank teachers for supporting the school counseling program. It's a wonderful time to share your results with your, with your staff, share with them the good work you're doing, the impact you're making, and thanking them for their support. If you're not aware of the social media kit counselors, please take a look at these websites and you can get uh, social media kits to support and promote your profession because that's the advocacy we need to do for our profession that we serve. Ah, deep breath coming to a close here. I wanna go back to where we started. I wanna go back to where we started because I want you to go back to where you started too. You became a school counselor to make a difference, I'm sure as well, but you might also have a different why. So I want you to pause for a moment and sit and think about what is your why? And if you'd like to share it on the right hand side, you can, there's no requirement. But if you'd like to share why you became a counselor, what you hope would be different because you became a school counselor, sometimes it's good to own that and to remind ourselves why we became a school counselor because it can keep us going on days when we're feeling prickly or our sponge is empty or we're feeling all shriveled up with that. My why started when I was six years old. <laughs> yes, that's me going off to school, super happy to love school. But as it turned out, when I was in seventh grade, I didn't have such a good time. I really got bullied in seventh grade. I don't know why, who knows? Maybe I was super enthusiastic and passion more so than I should have been, who knows? All I know is didn't have a good seventh grade, could have used a school counselor. And for me, knowing that this girl with that smile didn't have that smile in seventh grade, 
that that you know knowing that i would have benefited greatly from a counselor at that time and it's not like i turned out horrible or anything but it sure would have been a lot better experience had i had a counselor to talk to at school if i didn't have one i don't want my granddaughter not to have one when she is in seventh grade and i am passionate about this because i want that smile on my face to be the smile on every student's face when they go to school and our kids don't always look like that when they come they need school counselors to help them find out what's going on why why you look different today what happened that we should talk about this little six-year-old girl never knew that someday she'd be sitting in the eisenhower building right there over here talking about how every student deserves a school counselor i never in a million years would have thought that but who knows where life takes us I became a school counselor because I wanted to make sure my granddaughter, here she is right here, that's the same age I was two slides ago, has a school counselor. And then my grandson has a school counselor because right now where they live, they do not. And there's no requirement. And that's not okay. I want every student to have a school counselor and I'm passionate until they do. So I have hope. And there they are, see, I have hope. There she is, our new first lady, talking about school counselors right Above them is my hope. Those grandchildren are my hope. I know you want your grandchildren to have school counselors someday. And I know that in order to do that, we've got to take care of our mental health. Our mental health is critical and crucial. And if we aim to best support our students, we need to take care of ourselves. So if your sponge is not completely full on this right-hand side, take a look at the left-hand side, remind yourself why you got into this work. And today at this conference, I hope that you will ask yourself, how can I feed my why? How can I fill my sponge? How can I unprickly my sponge? Oops, I touched this, sorry. And how can, how can I make sure that my sponge is as full as it needs to be for the students I serve? And counselors, I hope you'll do a check-in with yourself because if you do need a mental health day so that you can come back the next day with a full sponge, you've got to do what you need to do to take care of you right now. And administrators, if you're noticing your counselor, has not rested and you're seeing emails at 11 at night and you know how it, who they are, please remind them, check in with them. Maybe say something like, is your sponge empty? Like, do you need to take a day and fill your sponge? Because we can't serve others until we serve ourselves first. Like they say with the mask, you gotta put it on first before you can help others on the airplane. Although that's only meaning, only meaning now, please think about taking care of yourself counselors. We need you, we need you to do the work you're doing because we need you to support and promote so that we can resolve the Bermuda Triangle of counseling. What you do makes a difference every day. You answer that call. Jessica Vargas put this online, I love this. It said, my favorite Google Meet interaction with my student today. Student, I miss you so much. Me, I miss you too. The person in the background, who are you talking to? The student, my Miss Vargas, my counselor. Person in the background says, oh, I thought it was your best friend. The student said, she is my best friend. Okay, that makes me have hope. That makes me, that fills me because when school counselors fill students and create those relationships, that makes all the difference in the world. Today, you made a choice to be here. You didn't have to come. You could have done other things, but you chose to do this. Your work makes a difference. You answer the call. You have a conference that you can fill your sponge with today. I hope that you will do that. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I want to thank my whole team, all of those counselors you see on the right hand side. Our, our Hatch and Results company focuses on transforming school counseling programs so that you can get the measurable outcomes that students deserve. We want to see consistent alignment of services and we hope that you're able to get the support you need it, um, and we will continue to work with the county through our, our uh, collaboration and the grant that they have. We're excited about that. And if you want to know more about HOPE or you would like to uh, see what we're doing at our conference, here's the information that you need for that. And we want to make sure that you know that our target audience is really for superintendents, principals, assistant principals, board members, anyone leading programs. It's all about leading because we need our leaders to advocate for our profession. And counselors, if you're planning to be a leader in this work too, please come, please join us. We'd love to have you there. And with that, I want to say thank you for Lori for having me. Thank you for asking me. And let me see if we have, I just want to thank everyone in the text box. Terry, did we have any outline questions we didn't answer? 
There is one. I don't know if it's a brief question, but I'm going to throw it out there. You might have a brief response. When you were talking about the conceptual diagram and the yes. data metrics there, yes. somebody had asked how that may align to higher education. And are there some systems in which they could still use some of those same practices to support their school counseling programs? So when you're saying higher ed, do you mean school counselors in graduate school? Because I did the same concept with them, making sure that everything I taught my graduate students I thought about their attitude, knowledge, and skills to get their outcomes. I'm not sure if that's what you mean. Giselle, I'm going to kick it over to you if you're on there. I think. Or, you know what? You guys have my email. Email me individually. If you have a question for the conceptual diagram around anything in particular, I'm perfectly open to that. And I'd love to have a deeper conversation with you. That would be great. I just want to thank you all. Thank you for being patient with me today. You know, I've been doing hundreds of these. Terry, this is the first time I had a little meltdown in the beginning, but we got through it, didn't we? And I don't know why it happened, but who knows? Stuff happens. But what do counselors do? We persevere and we have hope and we did it. They, Terry, thank you for always being there for me. And Lori, thank you for the invitation. Oh, and special shout out to Sharon Twitty because she's my good friend. For those of you who know her, she gets a special shout out. Thank you so much. Trish, I just want to say too, before Lori goes on there, tons of thank yous for the great presentation and resources shared. So amazing job. Thanks for having me. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Hatch, for your words this morning and for the continuing that feeling of renewed hope that has been in the air over this last week. So we are so grateful for your wisdom and your advocacy. Um, I just wanted to share with the participants before you go off, uh, as a special bonus, uh, we are raffling off five registration fees for the Hatching Results 2021 National School Counselor Leadership Conference on February 10th and 11th uh, to those who attend all their sessions today. So uh, it is an amazing event. So if you're given the opportunity, I would highly encourage you to attend and learn more. If you need any assistance with the platforms, if it troubles you at all today, please feel free to reach out to Therese or me. Um, just email us, we'll be available all day throughout the day. And uh, of course, uh, if you during this break, if you have a minute, you can visit that section on focusing on mindfulness uh, during your break. But thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Hatch, Terry. Um, your first session starts at 10:10. We hope you all have a wonderful day of learning. Thank you so much.